but today is the first day, so there's hope somewhere along the line. <laughs> Before I introduce our speaker this morning, I want to remind you please to turn off your cell phones and put them away and turn on your T-coil if that applies to you. Today we are very happy to welcome Dr. Liz Rodriguez to speak with us um, from the college. And she is um, going to speak to us today on Becoming American, Immigra Immigration Narrative and U.S. Autobiography. Let's all welcome Liz. So my microphone should be on. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak with you this morning. Um, immigrant narrative and immigrant autobiography is one of the areas that I study as a scholar of autobiography, or as we would call it, life writing, um, because there's multiple forms, as we'll talk about in a little bit in a minute. Um, and I'm very happy to get to come and share a little bit with you about um, how I and other scholars have been thinking about um, this tradition of telling life stories as American life stories and whose life story gets to be called American, um, whose life story gets cast as an immigration story or the story of becoming an American. Um, and so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, when I teach American autobiography, I often start by asking my students a question which is this, was Benjamin Franklin an American? <laughs> and <laughs> at first, um, they, they give me kind of a, a look of like, well, of course he was. And uh, then they start giving me kind of a panicked look, like, wait a minute, <laughs> why are you asking me this? <laughs> Um, and uh, then, then they start to think, and then they, they, they start to think, well, I guess it depends upon how you define American. And that's, of course, the whole point of asking the question. Um, so once they've had a chance to think about it, and they've had a chance to ask Google, and they've had a chance to <laughs> ask their friends, um, they realize that it's, it's not quite as simple as a yes, no um, answer in terms of the kind of definition that we think of as constituting an American today. Because on the one hand, Benjamin Franklin is practically synonymous with the word American. Um, he was a signer of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He's on the $100 bill. Um, he, was, <laughs> he was an ambassador um, of this country, um, even before it was a country. So um, how could he not be American? Um, on the other hand, um, if you think about what um, the definition of American is um, according to the 14th Amendment, which actually wasn't codified until 1868, um, uh, an American is all persons born or naturalized in the United States. Um, well, he couldn't have been born in the United States because the United States didn't exist um, when he was born, although he was born in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but at that time, in the state of Massachusetts, if you were born to parents who were British citizens, you were, as well, a British citizen. Um, there, was no, there was no United States to be a citizen of, and um, citizenship followed the, the lineage of the parents. Um, and interestingly, even though Benjamin um, Franklin's mother was born in the United States, she too was born to two um, British citizens. So she was British through and through by the law at that time, and his father had actually immigrated from England um, with some kids already in tow. So, um, you know, it was, they were considered British by law. Um, so, so born in the United States as an American, that's out of the picture. So naturalized, um, the first formal process of naturalization was codified in 1890, um, actually uh, at the end of March in 1890. Um, Benjamin Franklin died in the middle of April of 1890. So he, he probably, in those kind of three weeks, never went through that formal process <laughs> of becoming naturalized. Um, and of course, you know, the, the kind of more official version of this question is, you know, that uh, he was a British citizen. Um, England was no longer sovereign in the territory um, of the state that he was living in, um, so his, his citizenship kind of naturally passed into being that of the United States. Um, but he certainly wasn't born that way, and he didn't have to go through an application process in the way that we would normally think of it. 
Um, so at some point, he clearly became American, and he became even more than officially American. He kind of became this symbolic American. Um, and in some ways, that's, that's very uh, typical of American autobiography, in that the kind of official narrative of becoming American um, is far less memorable than the kind of symbolic narrative of how um, individuals engage with what, what does it mean to be an American. It's not simply stepping across a border. Um, it, there's a lot of other um, elements that uh, are considered important um, as well, both the legal process and the more cultural um, markers that you have. Um, so in some ways, this story of becoming American is the most American story of all, and it gets told um, over and over and over again by many people. Um, we often talk about um, this becoming American, this being an immigrant, right, as this defining feature of our country. Um, I have a, the full quote up later in the slides, but Barack Obama, as recently as 2014, said in an address to the nation, we are a nation of immigrants. We'll hear that phrase over and over again in our public discourse. Um, the current website for the um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration page, which is under the Department of Homeland Security, currently says, the United States has a long history of welcoming immigrants from all parts of the world. America values the contributions of immigrants who continue to enrich this country and preserve its legacy as a land of freedom and opportunity. It also says, if you meet certain requirements, you may become a U.S. citizen, either at birth or after birth. So, for a variety of reasons, it seems to be very important to us that this element of becoming remains a part of American identity. Um, we want to maintain, as part of our narrative identity, that you do not have to be born American, you can also become American. And it's just a very foundational part of the story that we tell ourselves as a nation. And I don't really call that a story to say that it's not true, um, because for someone who studies literature, um, we know that stories, even when they may not have a basis in fact, can have a deep basis in meaning. Um, and the meaning that we find in stories. So the more that these stories get told and retold, the more meaningful in some ways they become for all of us as we're defining what it means to be an American. So um, the talk today is to think about um, how this story of becoming American is uh, the most American story of all, and we're gonna do that by thinking about how this story is represented in autobiographies of people who were not born as citizens of the United States, but who came to the U.S. to live. So um, a couple of the stories that we're going to be looking at come from this period um, that some refer to as the heyday of immigration in the United States. Um, and there were a lot, this is right around the, the turn of the 20th century, there was just this whole bumper crop of autobiography by first-generation European immigrants. Um, and in literary studies, these have started to form a little bit of a canon of immigrant autobiography. Um, so we're going to take a look at Mary Anton's The Promised Land and Constantine Panuzio's Soul of an Immigrant, um, but there's just so many others, um, including Michael Pupin's From Immigrant to Inventor, which won the Pulitzer Prize when it came out, um, uh, Edward Steiner, uh, formerly a professor at Grinnell College, um, wrote From Alien to Citizen, um, and there's uh, other famous ones, The Making of an American um, by Jacob Rees, um, better known for How the Other Half Lives, and um, uh, the Americanization of um, Edward Bach, who was one of the original editors of the Ladies Home Journal. So there was just this kind of flourishing um, period where flourishing of the um, immigrant autobiography genre. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of those from this kind of classical period of immigration. Um, but the bigger question I want to ask is, you know, is every um, autobiography um, written by someone who was born outside of the United States and then comes into the United States to live, do all of those autobiographies fit the model of the immigrant narrative? So who gets to tell the story of being an immigrant? And whose story of becoming American becomes a story that we then embrace as American? Um, I think what I see is that we have these kind of stories that form a foundation, but that every person who um, comes to tell their story as someone becoming American um, both forms a challenge to that foundation, um, calling it up short, 
saying how that story fails to capture their experience and fails to capture the real meaning of being American. Um, and then they also um, embrace it. And in embracing it, they expand the story to include new groups of people and new sets of experiences. So as this story gets, these stories, kind of foundational stories, get retold, um, the definition of American is being debated and um, over time expanded, contracted, shifted. Um, so to get started, um, let's go ahead and work on defining some terms. Okay, so when I use the word American, I use it as an adjective referring to the United States or a person from the United States. And I use it with kind of some quotation marks around it because um, at the kind of literal level, American refers to anything in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and we know that that's not really how it gets used. Um, I studied abroad uh, when I was in my undergraduate um, education and I went to England for a year and they don't ask, are you from the United States? They ask, are you from America? <laughs> and um, I, I really found myself really taken aback by that because I thought of America more as of an idea than a place, but it's an idea that seems very real um, in a lot of cultural spaces outside of the United States. Um, so when we use the term American, we're, we're actually kind of claiming this bigger cultural space um, of you know, land of opportunity and freedom and capitalism. Um, and this, it, it becomes this kind of shorthand for something that's actually bigger um, and more romantic in a lot of ways than the literal 50 United States and the messy workings of our democratic government. Um, so it often means this more spiritual, um, ideological affinity to these values of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, so I use that term because a lot of what I'm talking about today does have to do with defining that myth, that mythos of what it means to be from the United States and have this American identity. Um, but I do want to recognize that um, as a term, the word American is actually much more ambiguous. Um, and there's also movements um, by scholars and just every old yeah, everyday people um, from all across the North and South America to kind of take back the term American to mean to mean more of this kinship between North and South America so that someone living in a South American country is also American um, in, in some ways. But when I'm using it today, I'm using it kind of in the most traditional sense in our cultural context. Okay, um, so who is an American? We looked at this um, codified by the 14th Amendment, persons born or naturalized in the United States. Um, which, again, wasn't codified until 1868, pretty fair piece after the adoption of the Constitution. Um, and the date might look um, familiar in terms of it being pretty shortly after the end of the Civil War. Um, and so all of these questions of citizenship come up at times of um, turmoil and debate. And um, there were a whole lot of people who were born outside of the United States or whose parents were born outside of the United States and um, had been brought into the United States, not by choice, um, formerly enslaved folks who did not have citizenship, um, and yet perhaps they were born in the United States, um, never formally naturalized, and here they still are. So this, this definition is in some way an attempt to deal with um, one of these first major examples of recognizing, hey, there's a lot more people living in our borders than those that we typically um, would think of, or we currently are thinking of as American in the sense of having a vote, having, having citizenship status. Um, so who can become an American um, through that kind of naturalization? So 1890, as I mentioned, the first naturalization process was legislated. It was pretty straightforward. If you were a white man or woman and you had resided in the territory that was now the United States for two years, you could simply say, I would like to be a citizen of the US, and there you have it. Um, a couple years later, they revised it. They moved it to five years. Um, later on, they moved it to 10 years. So the bar went up, but if you were a breathing white person within the borders, you, were, you had a, a straight shot at it. Um, 1868, that's when the 14th Amendment um, gets put in place during Reconstruction. Uh, 1882, there's a pretty important piece of immigration legislation which says that um, basically if you're of Chinese descent, if you're from China, you can under no circumstances become a citizen of the United States. You can live here, you can work here, 
um, but you cannot become a citizen. And that um, Exclusion Act gets renewed perpetually uh, until, I believe it's 1943, sometime in the 40s. So there was this whole period where um, people were welcome to come and work and live, um, but there was no expectation they could get a vote or have access to, um, well, there wasn't much of a social safety net during this period, but um, have access to any kind of like social recognition. Um, they were always kind of here at the mercy of the law. Um, 1924, which is, um, we would consider the, the end of kind of the heyday of immigration that I mentioned, um, that's when the Johnson Reed Act gets passed. Um, prior to this, if you were um, not from China, <laughs> and um, actually several Asian countries, but um, and you were from Europe, there was basically Europe or South America, um, there was basically an open border for you. Um, you could just come across and go through the naturalization process. Um, and so this is where you get that kind of period um, of uh, largely European immigration, 1880 to about, well, 1920, 1924, um, where we saw massive, massive numbers of immigrants, um, especially from Europe. So um, it was estimated that um, it was about 650,000 people a year during a time when the population of the US was about 75 million. So it was a lot of folks. <laughs> um, and then, and you'll see um, the first couple of autobiographies we're gonna look at come out of this period um, where the numbers were just really, really high. And all of a sudden there was, started to be this kind of question about can we keep this up? Um, what does it mean to keep, um, keep these borders open? Can we expect this many immigrants every year forever? Um, and that's where this big debate about who can become American, not in a legal sense, but in a cultural and spiritual sense, um, really takes flight. And that's the concept, that's the context in which a lot of these classic um, immigrant autobiographies are written. Um, so so a, a lot of these autobiographies were written in this attempt to make the case that anyone can become an American. Look at me. I had these challenges. I had um, these setbacks. Um, I had these things that you wouldn't normally associate with being Ameri an American, but now I have a job, I have a family, I have an education, and I love this country. So I, if I can become an American, other people can become American too. Um, ultimately, that was not entirely persuasive um, to politicians because they did pass in 1924 uh, the act establishing that there was going to be limited um, numbers of immigrants allowed legally into the United States and that those were going to be based on national quotas. Um, you may have heard something about this at some point, but the idea was, I think, to keep the proportions of different nationalities the same. So the quota was based on the number of people of that kind of line of descent that were in the country um, during, they kept debating what census it was gonna be, but I think they finally landed on the 1890 census. They said that was a good time. So we'll just try to keep everything in the same proportion as that. Um, and that kind of lasted until 1965, which was kind of our last huge um, overhaul of immigration law, um, and that the Hart-Seller Act removed, national, removed the national quotas, um, and, uh, but they did keep a, t a cap on the total number of immigrants that would be let in every year, and then they established a hierarchy of preference, um, seven, seven different categories of immigrant, and um, which ones were the most desirable, basically. So um, if you kind of take this, very basic definition. What is an immigrant? Someone who immigrates. A person who comes to a country to take up a permanent residence. Um, that that uh, implies that all who are coming to the United States to live um, get this category of immigrant. And that's where we uh, can get kind of a basic definition of this idea of the immigrant narrative. Um, which uh, the definition that I have here on the screen um, comes from a study of the novel, but uh, it's a pretty good model for when we think about immigration um, as a narrative, we, we kind of think of it as a classic story with the following features. Um, it has been understood as a tale of arrival to a new world, which includes trials of belief in the self and the new nation, optimism and obstacles, economic and social acceptance, concluding with a disillusioned Americanism. So, <laughs> so um, 
yeah, it, it's rarely, you know, as in most things in life, coming to a country is rarely, rarely matches your ideal of what that was meant to be. But maybe it's good enough anyway, and maybe you found a spot that um, you now identify with, hence the term kind of disillusioned. But it's interesting that even this basic, this would be like this basic definition, which almost no actual immigrant narrative meets, um, because there's all kinds of ins and outs and changes and different things that this model doesn't anticipate. Um, even the most basic model anticipates that things are going to be hard, and that the United States is not going to be what you thought it was going to be um, at some point. Um, so if we think about like the definition of an immigrant, someone who comes who comes to a, a country that they weren't born in as a place to live, um, and we think about the immigrant narrative as this model of a beginning, middle, and end, it kind of implies a trajectory. Um, so when we say immigrant, we often are talking about this this implied trajectory. If we call somebody an immigrant, um, we're we're kind of casting them in this. Uh, directionality, um, which is, you know, you came from outside the United States and now you're coming to the United States. And a lot of things can happen in that little arrow period, but um, once you're here, you're here. Um, so, um, I can come back to this in a second. Um, but immigrant isn't the only word that we could use to talk about those who are born outside of the U.S. and then come to the U.S. Um, when I first started studying immigrant autobiography, again, studying these kind of really canonical um, works from this 1880 to 1920 period, I had kind of internalized this definition of immigrant um, as just someone born outside the U.S. who comes to the U.S. to live, and all of those autobiographies seemed to confirm that. Um, but as I studied more, um, I realized that actually there's always been a lot of mobility within our borders, and um, that there were all these different other experiences of people who were born outside of the U.S., came to the U.S., but didn't necessarily become citizens or didn't even necessarily aspire to become citizens. Um, so when do we use the word immigrant instead of the word foreigner, um, instead of the word migrant, refugee, sojourner? Um, sojourner is a word that we often use for folks who um, are coming to the United States for pretty much economic reasons. They, they take regular journeys from their home country to the U.S. Um, and then go back. They have kind of an economic um, goal that they're trying to meet. Um, Sojourner was a pretty popular category for Asian American um, folks coming, or Asian folks, uh, during the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? There was no way they were going to become citizens, but they would often, um, the men especially, would come and work and kind of try to make some money and then plan on going home um, to, to live there. So they have all these experiences in the United States um, that some of them have written about that don't fall under the rubric of uh, this idea everybody wants to become an American. Everybody thinks of the United States as their final destination. Um, just a couple more words that can be synonymous in certain contexts. Um, resident or alien. Um, regarding, I mean, aside from the fact that um, certain groups of people to whom um, these terms have been applied, and I'm thinking here specifically about alien, aside from the fact that um, certain groups have advocated against some of these terms, they all have a literal meaning um, outside of um, the, the kind of political context that they get used in. So, you know, there's all these different categories of experience um, and motivation that can um, inflect how we think about people who were born outside of the United States but then come here. So when we use immigrant, we're actually selecting a very specific model for how we're imagining um, what people's life journeys are going to be and what their trajectories are. Um, I think one other thing to notice is that um, as, uh, again, we, we think Immigrant can often be used in literary um, study um, as kind of a catch-all category for ethnic or minority, um, but not all minorities in the United States fall under um, this strict category of, um, of um, immigrant, where you know they have a lineage that's outside, that is from a country outside the United States and then came into it, but yet they have a very conflicted relationship to American identity. Um, and so immigrant isn't a particularly good category for dealing with um, the, the literal fact that uh, formerly enslaved people um, were 
again, they, they have a lineage outside of the United States, were forcibly brought to the United States. Does that mean that they're immigrants too? Um, well, there's a reason we don't use that term. Um, and it has to do with, again, histories, with this assumption that an immigrant in some ways chooses to come to the United States. Um, and also that at some point, if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen, um, but that doesn't necessarily deal with this kind of residue of exclusion and marginalization that can come along with um, being a uh, part of um, a minority group like formerly enslaved people, or um, there's also a whole group of people, which again, I wasn't aware of really, I hadn't thought about it until I was in graduate school. Um, people who, were, who um, during the 19th and early 20th centuries were living in territories that were not the United States, and then the next day, or the United States. Um, so we're thinking um, especially about um, folks who were living in northern Mexico when um, Mexico lost the U.S.-Mexico War and a whole chunk of the U.S. Um, just, well, a whole chunk of land became the U.S. Um, whether those people had moved or not. Um, same thing happened again in Hawaii and Alaska. Um, even though a lot of rhetoric was about, uh, a lot of the, the public rhetoric um, about, for example, Alaska was that it's empty, nobody's there. Well, there certainly were people there. <laughs> How did they become Americans? Um, and then there's also these longer, longer trajectories um, in, the, uh, in the later 20th century, um, thinking about folks who come under the refugee category. Um, so uh, I'm thinking especially of Hmong and Cambodian populations who were displaced as a result of um, US military action in Vietnam. Um, and they're brought over as refugees, but then their story can get kind of transmuted into this immigrant story without thinking specifically about um, what were the circumstances. They didn't choose to come to the United States, right? It was, it was an act of desperation. Um, and what kind of options did they have for inclusion? Like, what's your motivation to learn English, again, when you didn't choose to come to the United States? Um, but you're really, you're wondering if you're ever going to go home, you're in this limbo status. Um, so again, applying this immigrant model to all folks who come to the United States from somewhere else can kind of lose a lot of the specificity of different experiences that people have in the course of becoming American. Um, this, so, yeah? What about Native Americans? That would be another great example. <laughs> yeah? Who were That's another great example. Um, they, you know, what is their relationship to American identity? Um, at some point, some of them get claimed as United States citizens, but not all of them would accept that claiming. Um, so if you look at their autobiographies, you'll see kind of a very different negotiation, right? And there's kind of moments where it's been very important to maintain the sovereignty of um, indigenous tribes and indigenous, indigenous nations, and then there's other moments and um, other kind of political aims where it's more important to blur the boundaries and also claim American identity at the same time. Yeah, yeah. so um, that kind of, that's a, a, that question kind of takes us back to this, um, this very common statement that, um, you know, uh, we are a nation of immigrants, and so this is one one of the more recent iterations of that language. Um, my fellow Americans, we are and always will be a nation of immigrants. We were strangers once too, and whether our forebears were strangers who crossed the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Rio Grande, we are here only because this country welcomed them, them in and taught them that to be an American is about something more than what we look like or what our last names are or how we worship. What makes us Americans is our shared commitment to an ideal that all of us are created equal, and all of us have the chance to make of our lives what we will. Um, so this is a pretty concise statement of that mythology, that what makes you an American um, is the fact that you became American by sharing this spiritual identity, this commitment to an ideal. Um, and I don't want to be overly critical um, of the president here. This is very common rhetoric, and his aim, his rhetorical purpose in making this statement um, is, uh, was to kind of create a push for inclusion. Um, he's talking specifically about the DREAM Act and about creating um, a path to citizenship for um, people who 
uh, were brought to the United States as children before they had a say in the matter um, and have never, uh, their parents did not um, have uh, legal authorization or documentation for their journey, so um, the children don't either, but they've completely grown up in the United States. Um, he's making a lot of assumptions here. He's casting a very big net. So, I mean, I think his rhetorical purpose is one of inclusion, but I do want to be careful about this language of we are all immigrants, um, because for the very good reason, um, actually, no, not all of us are. Um, because there are remain um, native indigenous people in um, all countries in the Western Hemisphere. Um, they never moved, <laughs> they, at least not in our kind of current frame of reference. Um, and uh, there are folks who come to the United States um, and, and perform really important roles, um, especially labor and economic roles, um, and have since the founding of the country that do not have citizenship and never had a path to citizenship um, or even personhood in the case of enslavement. Um, so to say we're all immigrants is really to kind of like paper over some really important historical differences that affect um, the opportunities that individuals have still today. Um, but I also understand the rhetorical gesture, right? Can we find this common ground um, in that we, we all have a story of, you know, how our, we're, you know, all, all of us white folks, we all have a story of how our families came um, and can we find a common ground in that way? Um, but there's actually a lot, there's a lot going on um, in this term, immigration, and these different histories of how people have come and what opportunities have been legally available to them when they got here. Okay. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, I apologize, um, but uh, what these two lines are is um, a charting of um, the word foreigner versus immigrant. So just as a kind of example of that we haven't always used the word immigrant so expansively or at all, um, and that we've sometimes used other words. Um, so this is a, a tool called the bookworm that is searching um, digitized texts that are available in something called the Hathi Trust Library, um, which is a copy, the, the copy that academic libraries own of all the books that Google Books has scanned. Um, so with some caveats, this is in no sense all of the books ever written, not even close. It's not even all the books that have been digitized. It's a portion of those books. Um, what do they say here? Four million volumes. So in roughly four million books, um, I've done a search for two words, foreigner and immigrant. And um, I've limited it to English language and uh, publication um, country, US. And you can see, like if, if, if the, if we've been able to make the numbers bigger, um, what these two lines are showing is the relative frequency of these two words over time in these books. And so um, you'll see the one that's the blue line, that's the word foreigner, and the one that, that's the orange line, that's the word immigrant. So um, for as far back as we have these kind of digitized textual records in Hadi Trust, so 1760s-ish, um, the word foreigner used to be a lot more common than the word immigrant. And then, right, the, the two lines kind of cross somewhere between 1880 and 1900, and all of a sudden this idea of the immigrant really takes off, and the idea of the foreigner continues to, to dip down. Um, and so I show this both to show that the words we use for things have changed over time, and also to show that, um, you know, the, for the last, you know, 100 and 20, 140 years or so, there has been a lot of debate in the United States about immigration and this sense that all who come to the U.S., right, there's no such thing as foreigners anymore, there's potential immigrants. Um, if they're here, they must mean to stay here. And that becomes kind of the main thing that we're focused on as, um, as you know, kind of public discourse. So, again, yeah, just, just an interesting language shift, right? You rarely hear the word foreigner anymore. Um, you almost always hear um, immigrant or now migrant. Okay, so um, wrapping this up, um, we're getting a little bit close to break. Um, wrapping this up a little bit, when we think about immigrant, instead of thinking about um, this kind of one-way 
uh, narrative trajectory, right? You come from outside of the United States and now you come to the United States. That's the destination you have in mind. That's your goal. Um, we can actually see kind of a much more complicated uh, picture of mobility and movement. And we can even see this in texts of auto, like autobiographical texts themselves. These aren't just um, historical things that we know. If we look closely at the text, we can actually start to see these patterns get a lot more complicated. Um, so we certainly do still have people coming from outside who come here to live. We also have um, people who are more in the sojourner model that I was talking about, where it's a traffic back and forth. Um, they may not ever plan to have residents here. Um, we have movement within the United States. Uh, you know, um, there's the great African American migration from south to north, and again, not necessarily immigration, but certainly um, a, a move in search of opportunity and a move to try to address shortcomings in citizenship and enfranchisement. Um, we have, uh, you know, the kind of the person there on the west coast um, will be modeled by one of the books I'll talk about after the break, Carlos Bulasan's America is in the Heart. These populations of um, migrant laborers from Asia and uh, south of us who circulate up and down the West Coast perpetually, um, don't have a stopping point. They're always working. Um, they're not kind of destined to be incorporated into the social fabric. Um, but yet, they're here for a very long time, and they start to um, propose new definitions of being American. Um, and then, you know, we also have the arrows moving out. We have histories of deportation um, and what we would call voluntary deportation. This idea, if we make it hard enough, um, some people will eventually just leave, and so that's also a reality. Or people just choosing to go back uh, to wherever they came from because the opportunity becomes available and they decide that that's what they want to do. Um, so there's actually all kinds of mobility and immigration um, is much more complex than this kind of one-way narrative. Um, and it's even more complex when you look at it at a, at a cultural literary level. Um, so before we get to the break, I'll try to just get through the next couple terms pretty quickly, the key terms. So autobiography, when I say autobiography, what am I talking about? Um, well, you can break down the roots of the word. Um, self, life, writing. So auto, self, bio, life, um, and putting that down in writing. Um, my a basic definition of this would be that it's a book where the author and the subject are the same. Um, it, it's a book that tends to cover um, the period of life from birth to the present versus something like a memoir, which tends to focus more on a specific experience or relationship. Um, it tends to give life a narrative form. Um, and they're, they're almost never written just because. They're usually written for an occasion. Um, someone has asked someone to tell their life story. So we can learn a lot about what the rhetorical purpose of that story is by looking at um, when was the book written, where was the book written, and what are some of the reasons that it might have been written, that that story might have been told. Um, and implicitly, autobiography, because it uses the I, um, which is a pronoun, so it's referring to a specific person, but the text has that I, um, we t it starts to kind of blur the boundaries between that individual historical person and this idea of what a person can be in that time and place. Um, and so we can look at it not just for the life story of a particular person, but how the life story of a person is being imagined. Um, in a particular time and place. Um, I think that's probably a pretty good place to stop before we get to the break. Now, taking your seats so that we can continue listening to Dr. Rodriguez. Okay, so we ended uh, right before the break just thinking about um, a little bit about what is an autobiography and why study autobiography because there's all different kinds of ways of studying people's lives um, and there's all different kinds of ways of studying U.S. history and immigration in particular. Um, so I would certainly never say that this is the authoritative or only way of doing it, um, but when we're looking at autobiographies, we're looking, um, I think, and a lot of others think, at this act of representation. Um, that tells us more than just about that specific person. It tells us about um, ideas of being a person and what the questions are around who belongs 
um, in the United States at a specific time. So when we're thinking about autobiography, I'm at least when I'm thinking about it as a literary scholar, I'm less concerned about um, that it shows that this particular thing actually happened to this particular person at this particular time than what kind of story it's trying to tell about what it means to be an American. Um, and so we'll start with Benjamin Franklin, um, our famous, uh, slightly ambiguous American. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so his autobiography has become, in many ways, the canonical American autobiography. Um, and it's interesting because, um, first of all, autobiography isn't a word that he probably would have ever heard um, in his lifetime. It was a neologism, which means a new word um, that kind of took off at the very end of um, the uh, 18th century and became much more popular in the 19th century. Um, and if you read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, which I have just one copy of it up here, one thing that's going to be really surprising is that it's in four different parts. The first part is a letter to his son um, that he may or may not have ever intended to have published. Um, the second part, which, which is probably the most famous part, is um, his plan for attaining moral perfection, um, which has this whole series of charts about how he's going to spend his time every day and how he's going to keep score for himself to eventually become a better and better person. Um, and then uh, parts three and four are um, parts that he potentially did write for publication. They're written at, um, you know, decades later after he writes the first part, and they're really about the nitty-gritty of nation building, about holding meetings and having committees and um, getting people to vote certain ways, um, at the same time as managing businesses, and um, also he has a little chapter about his scientific experiments as well. Um, so the, the first kind of compiled published version um, was published um, not until 1818, so what is that, um, almost 30 years after his death, um, by a kind of ne'er-do-well grandson. Um, it wasn't very good. <laughs> um, he, he actually sold off the manuscript copy to make some money, um, and then paid to get a copy of the manuscript <laughs> back, um, and uh, he didn't put together a very good version. Um, and it took him 30 years, and there was a huge market for um, Benjamin Franklin life writing. So um, a couple people stepped in to fill the void, and there were these kind of popular biographies that were actually circulated along with what his autobiography was. Um, so it was pretty widely read in the 19th century, but what version people were reading is, um, you know, it varies quite a bit. The first kind of good version that we have of it was published in 1868, so again, pretty far down the road, um, during this period where citizenship was very much under debate. Um, and why is Benjamin Franklin's autobiography considered so influential, given that we don't have a sing even a single version of it, like a, a version that is authoritative, really, um, or didn't for a very long time? Well, there was his personal fame. Um, I think it's kind of, you know, I've, I've read um, historian Jill Lepore writing about Benjamin Franklin's sister, Jane, and she just says, I think it's hard for people to kind of understand how famous Benjamin Franklin would have been in his time, um, how just dominant he was in so many different fields. He was a great self-promoter. Um, he did a lot of interesting things, and in some ways, he's just so consonant with these Puritan ideals uh, that many have argued kind of define American character. So hardworking, um, industrious, good with money, um, generous, but not um, easy to fool. Um, just very, he just seems like this kind of ideal matchup. Um, and in some ways, he's also this embodiment of democratic potential. Um, his, his father was a tradesperson, um, it, so they had means, um, but not extensive means, um, and they didn't have title. So um, the fact that he was able to rise to prominence in so many different fields was incredibly inspiring, and also he was really funny, too. So like, it's just, it's just a, good, a good blend. A lot of people really liked it. Um, so um, in a lot of ways, his autobiography can be seen as the template for American autobiography, that anybody who's coming after him, who's claiming to, who's trying to make a claim on American identity, um, is in some ways referencing this template story that he's laid out, even if they don't reference him directly. So, Humble Origins, he starts out by, again, talking about um, his father's kind of lack of status in England and his decision to immigrate to the United States. Um, the fact that he had, now I'm blanking on the exact number, but a lot of siblings. 
Um, and he was the youngest of them, and um, the only reason he got to go to school was because um, his father hadn't sent any kids to school yet, so he figured he should send one. Um, <laughs> and that that didn't even, um, that didn't even, you know, the idea of like, one of them should be a priest. Like, we gotta, you know, I've gotta at least put one in that, in that direction. Um, and uh, thinking about, um, and, but even that is disrupted schooling, right? So he gets to go to school, but he's also pulled out of school every time the family is short of money. So um, it's not a straight through trajectory. There's a lot of personal initiative, um, the way he tells it, that has to go into it. Um, literacy and education are perhaps kind of the defining features of himself and his success. Um, he talks about um, one of his, his early memories, my early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early, as I do not remember when I could not read. Um, he's talking again about this aptitude that he was showing for reading. Um, and he, he writes, from a child I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came into my hands ever laid out in books. Pleased with the Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was of John Bunyan's works in separate little volumes. Afterwards, I sold them to enable me to buy R. Burton's historical collections. So you have that, that little passage where he's talking about his love of reading accomplishes a couple different things that we now call very American. So he's self-educating. Um, he's self-educating um, for moral purpose, right? He just loves Pilgrim's Progress. And then he's also kind of entrepreneurial. I'm done with that book, so I'm going to sell it. And then I can buy a new book. Um, so he there's this kind of like industrious thinking ahead, smart use of money to improve himself um, that becomes very uh, admirable. Um, material and social accomplishment, so sorry, work, work and struggle, individuality actually, going back up, individuality. We see him making a break with his family. Um, his, he's actually um, apprenticed, his father becomes a candle maker in the US and he's uh, well, what would become the US and he's um, he recognizes that Ben doesn't want to be a candle maker, so he looks for some other places to apprentice Ben. And uh, he says, fine, I'll be a printer. Um, and so he apprentices Brent, Ben with one of his older brothers, who's already a printer. Um, he's supposed to stay there from the time he's like 13 to the time he's 21. Um, after about three years, um, Ben decides, nope, um, I'm done with that. I'm not going to stay under my brother's thumb. And he runs away from Boston to New York. Uh, and it's some pretty hard feelings. Uh, you know, his brother was counting on him um, to help him run the business, and there's this kind of investment in him that's not going to be, re be repaid directly. Um, but that's elevated in this story, that putting himself ahead of his family at that time um, was seen, it's, it's portrayed as like this irrepressible individuality, um, and that becomes a hallmark of American identity. Um, he portrays himself as working very hard. Um, let's see, uh, all, you know, he's always got a couple irons in the fire business-wise. Um, he, he works kind of all day. He writes, um, my time for exercises and for reading was at night, after work, or before work, began in the morning, or on Sundays. Um, so he's constantly working. Um, this, it's interesting, he's saying he likes to read on Sundays, so he's also kind of implying that he didn't like to go to church. Um, so, so that's interesting because he, um, he addresses religion, right? His family is very pious, um, but he again breaks away from his family to become less pious and do more work. Um, but he comes back to this middle ground where he says, you know, I, I thought I was going to give up completely on the idea of God, but then I read all these arguments against God and I didn't find them very convincing, so I came back around. And now I'm a deist, so this idea of um, God is the, the watchmaker, right? This removed, um, this removed kind of guiding force, or not guiding, the person who set it all in motion but isn't intervening now. Um, so anyway, but that, that kind of like, he's not accepting tradition, right? It's not necessarily about being religious or not being religious. He's not accepting tradition. He's modifying it to suit his own um, economic ends. Um, so, and obviously his material and social accomplishment is vast um, by the end of his life. And he is this um, embodiment of what it means to be an American. He helped create the country. So we can see this as a template that gets kind of revisited over and over again. Um, okay, we talked a little bit about that already. Um, 
Well, so we can see the template getting um, adapted. There will always be people, people kind of go through those milestones, right? Of like, um, what, of, of reading and literacy, of um, claiming this desire to learn and break with tradition and make something new. Um, and these ways of, these reiterations of those kind of milestones of Franklin's life um, become, or Franklin's life as this um, kind of uh, archetypal American life, um, it demonstrates the potential for that individual too to also become American. I'm like Benjamin Franklin, I'm doing the same things he did. Um, and they can also be seen as answers to whatever the contemporary debates are about immigration. Um, and they, they tend to affirm the United States as a destination and as a culmination of a journey towards opportunity. So you'll see these themes coming up several times. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting, of these early, early statesmen, whatever. Can I wait just one minute, please? Oh. No, I just, I, I don't want to interrupt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm curious because so many of the early founders were slaveholders. And, you know, and here is Franklin, the, you know, the template, and who really did have to work <laughs> financially when he started out. Yeah, I, I would defer to actual historians in the room. I believe Franklin had a dalliance with slaveholding, um, but or at least he was in support of it at one time in his political life, um, but then was not, um, then changed and actually became a pretty strong abolitionist. Um, but that's, that's, that's something that makes him emulatable, right? In that he was not um, born with land um, with uh, you know vast resources that he wasn't just managing established businesses he was running um, businesses and creating businesses so that's definitely a part of what makes him um, an apt model because most of us will not be born with uh, immense amounts of property yeah yeah and it's also not very American right to be born with immense amounts of property we want some kind of element of being self-made um, that is is part of this myth too um, and then we can also see, so we'll see certain elements of that template being adapted by immigrant narrative. Um, we'll also see certain elements of the template being transformed by immigrant narrative. Um, they will uh, take these vaunted ideals of Americanism and they will foreground um, instances when they did not play out, when they were discriminated against because of language or race. Um, and in that way, they're constantly calling the United States out on not living up to its ideals. Um, they'll speculate what is, whereas, you know, I, I'm not sure Benjamin Franklin actually even uses the word American, even once in his autobiography, but by the time these later ones are written, there's this idea of what is an American? Well, there's a real American versus an inauthentic American. Um, and that's always a question of values rather than citizenship. Um, They'll, a lot of immigrant autobiographers will refer to the real Americans as the people who were welcoming, as the people who did want to um, give other folks the space to make themselves in the way that they thought of themselves as being made. Um, so they'll also transform it by referencing points of affinity. They're, they're kind of expanding the definition of American um, to include multiple religions, multiple languages, multiple races. and. Um, often they'll kind of go through these, um, they'll, they'll include in immigrant autobiography uh, a rather large portion, considering it's supposed to be theoretically about coming to the United States and adapting to the United States. There will be large portions of immigrant autobiographies that take place in the home country. Um, and by kind of expanding the space that they give to explaining their home country and raising awareness about um, the culture in their home country, they're kind of putting the United States more on an even plane of comparison with other countries and calling into question this idea that the United States is this exceptional, um, one phrase for that exceptionality is city on the hill, that the United States is this is every immigrant's destination. No, it's potentially one place out of many, but they do this very subtly. Um, and they also um, are kind of troubling in, sense, in a sense, this idea that, um, that 
everybody in the United States is judged as an individual on their merits because they're kind of implicitly um, and sometimes explicitly making a case um, for their entire group, their group of origin, based on their own individual life story. So um, a lot of these writers, it's not enough to just say, I'm an American. What they also want to say is, I'm an American and you should let other people be Americans too, um, specifically people from my country. So. <laughs> Or at least, those are the ones I can talk about, and I can tell you that the ones from my country um, are good ones. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it sounds, you know, kind of cynical, but in some cases it's like the politically expedient thing to do, right? You've got to nudge the door open one little bit at a time. Um, so the first example, and maybe the most canonical example, um, is Mary Hinton's The Promised Land, which is published in 1912 in the context of something called the Dillingham Commission, which is um, a group that was uh, uh, legislated to study all current immigration patterns and make predictions about what immigration would mean for the United States going forward. Um, and it was um, actually commissioned by progressives, but by the time the report came out, political winds had shifted, and the report came to some pretty um, nativist con conclusions, uh, basically saying that you know, there were this, this old group of immigrants, which is folks from Western and Northern Europe. So I've already heard um, some shout outs to the Swedes and the Norse um, here. Those groups, those were good groups, right? Um, those were industrious Anglo-Saxon groups. Um, but the immigration that was on the rise at the time the report was um, issued was immigration from Southern Europe, so Italians and Greeks, and um, Eastern Europe, so Russians. Um, and those were considered bad groups. Um, they were worse. So the current immigrants were um, well, the current immigrants were a problem. The older immigrants were fine, but the newer immigrants were a problem. Um, so that it, it, that's you know it's always just been it, yeah <laughs> not the best. <laughs> um, and so she's writing as um, a Russian Jewish immigrant, actually, excuse me, not Russian, um, Lithuanian um, Jewish immigrant herself. Uh, she's writing to say, wait, I, I'm an American. I have come here, I've, um, I've come from one of these places that you consider a backwards place, and I'm an American par excellence. Um, and so she's, she's writing it to, to kind of make that case implicitly. Um, even though she doesn't necessarily mention that report in, uh, in the book itself. Um, so uh, this is often considered kind of the stereotypical celebratory immigrant narrative. Um, a lot of literary scholars have looked at this and go, no, it's, it's way too positive. Like she's just like, pace, you're, like papering over um, what must have been uh, a, a series of huge challenges um, and that and, uh, she was probably excluded from a lot more institutions than she was included in. Um, but I think to just call it celebratory is to overlook, first of all, that she's trying, she's really trying to make a case. Um, and so she wants to be affirming of American ideals, um, not just critical of them. Um, and also there's some kind of subtle ways that she goes about expanding um, what it means to be American by the way she's representing her life. Um, so, in terms of origins, so we'll kind of see these are just kind of the, the signposts that I've kind of picked out from the template. Um, she talks about her origins um, as being, she, she doesn't actually mention the name of a home country. Um, she mentions villages uh, because she lives in a Jewish settlement um, in a, a village in Lithuania that's currently being occupied by Russia. So, already by placing herself in this, um, in this kind of uh, place this village being occupied by Russia, she's drawing an affinity between herself and the United States, which has this um, history of rebelling against occupying tyrants. So she's starting by the way she portrays her origin, she's already starting to make that connection. Like, I have a, I'm coming from a similar position as you. Um, when she arrives in the US, um, she, uh, this is how she describes it. At last I was going to America, really, really going at last. The boundaries burst, the arch of heaven soared, a million suns shone out of every star. The, the winds rushed in from outer space, roaring in my ears, America, America. So um, her arrival is, uh, that is very celebratory, I would say. Um, so she's affirming this moment of arrival as a transformational moment. 
Um, the whole framing of her autobiography is, um, I had one life, and now I have a new life. She, she almost says, I could talk about myself in, in the third person because my life has changed so much. I've been so transformed by living in the United States. Um, so one way of decoding that is by saying, is saying like, if the United States has become suspicious of anybody who's from where she's from, she obviously would need to be totally different in order to be acceptable um, in the US. So making that claim for drastic transformation is a way of um, making the claim that someone can become American in a very radical sense. Um, literacy and education are perhaps the most um, memorable aspects of Mary Anton's autobiography. Um, there's the, maybe the key scene, um, she's started public school and she's worked very, very hard to learn English and they're having a President's Day celebration. Um, and this is how she talks about um, uh, reading the poem that she wrote for that celebration. On the day of the Washington celebration, I recited a poem that I had composed in my enthusiasm. But composed is not the word. The process of putting on paper, the sentiments that seethed in my soul, was really very discomposing. I dug the words out of my heart, squeezed the rhymes out of my brain, forced the missing syllables out of their hiding places in the dictionary. May I never again know such travail of the spirit as I endured during the fevered days when I was engaged on that poem. Going down a bit further, it was necessary to use polysyllables, and plenty of them, and where to find rhymes for words such as tyranny, freedom, and justice when you had less than two years acquaintance with English. The name I wished to celebrate was the most difficult of all. Nothing but Washington rhymed with Washington. <laughs> so she's, she's just portraying herself as being consumed by this um, process of celebrating George Washington um, because George Washington was a man who became president even though he was an ordinary man to begin with. Um, so by celebrating Washington, she's uh, indicating that she's uh, adapted this ideal that um, all are equal in the United States, which is interesting since she's a woman. Um, she's just emulating this figure, so she's kind of, again, suddenly putting herself in that position, both as an American and as a woman, um, in a position to, um, it, by emulating Washington, to kind of embrace that um, equality of opportunity. Um, individuality, you see her, um, again, you see this drive towards literacy and education, you see um, there's a, a kind of poignant scene where they're in the United States and the father has to choose which child to send to school and he picks her rather than her older sister. Um, and she kind of candidly says, and I didn't think anything of it because I was the one who was good at school. So um, therefore I was the one who should get to go. So, um, you know, even though her sister never got to go to school, her sister was just married off and then worked. Um, there's that sense of the celebration of self above family, um, which is considered very American. If you have the ambition and the skill, you, um, you pursue that. Um, a lot of her work and struggle, again, she's actually, I believe, 26 when she's writing this autobiography. Um, so she's not that far out of school herself. So work and struggle for her is mainly portrayed as school. Um, and material and social accomplishment, again, has a lot to do with education. So she graduates pretty much from middle school and goes to a very prestigious high school in Boston um, where she says, you know, I was sitting alongside the daughters of very well-to-do Bostonians. Um, so through her merit, she's propelled herself into this um, rarefied uh, space of knowledge attainment. Um, and her claiming of citizenship, um, it's, you know, it, it comes through all these little points, through writing a poem about George Washington, um, through then taking that poem from door to door to different newspapers to try to get it published in um, newspapers in Boston as a, as a kid. Did this actually happen? We don't know. But this is, um, this is how she portrays herself um, as someone who not only is writing but wants to get published and wants the acclaim. Um, and uh, so it's not just that she's writing something that's very pro-United States, she's also embodying that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. So. Um, she closes the book with probably her most, um, her most uh, forthright claim to citizenship. My spirit is not tied to the monumental past any more than my feet were bound to my grandfather's house below the hill. The past was only my cradle, and now it cannot hold me 
because I'm grown too big, just as the little house in Polotsk, once my home, has now become a toy of memory as I move about at will in the wide spaces of this splendid space whose shadow covers acres. No, it is not I that belong to the past, but the past that belongs to me. America is the youngest of the nations and inherits all that went before in history. And I am the youngest of America's children, and into my hands is given all her priceless heritage to the last white star spied through the telescope, to the last great thought of the philosopher. Mine is the whole majestic past, and mine is the shining future. So she, the past, her, her past, her uh, um, origin as a Lithuanian Jewish person isn't um, a liability anymore. It's actually the thing that makes her American, um, both because she's uh, disavowed it, right? She says, the past has no hold on me. So she's, she's embraced this complete transformation into being an American. Um, she's uh, said, the past has no hold on me. And that's great, because the United States, America, is the country that's all future. Um, and so I'm the most recent piece of the United States' is future, so I am, I am American, right? I, I am the one who's going to embody the vision of this nation going forward because I've been able to put my past behind me um, and adapt to this new space. So um, that's how she, one of the ways that she kind of claims this citizenship for herself, in addition to eventually getting formal citizenship. Okay. Um, just going to check the time real quick. Okay. Um, I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions, so I'm gonna gonna skip this example. Um, it's interesting. So it's it, well, it, it's it, it's interesting. So we'll go to um, uh, actually. I'm gonna go back to it. If we don't get <laughs> if we don't get to Bulasan, maybe we don't get to Bulasan. Um, but um, this is another. I want to actually just do a little comparison by another text that's coming out. Um, in a, you know, it's about a decade later, so it's not the exact same time. But it's this similar process. Again, 1921 is when Panunzio's Soul of an Immigrant comes out. It's still before um, the Johnson-Reed Act. So the debate is still very much ongoing about what immigration should be like in the United States. Um, so he's still writing from this period of relatively open borders for European immigrants. Um, he's, uh, his version of an origin story is uh, that he grows up in a little town in Italy. And he, like Anton, he spends a decent amount of time describing this. Before he even describes his family, he spends a whole chapter describing this town in Italy. Um, but his arrival is very different um, in that he, uh, it's, he doesn't come with his family as a child, as Mary Anton did. He um, kind of liberates himself from his family. He says, I was called to the sea, which interestingly, um, Benjamin Franklin also talks about being called to the sea. Um, he settles for printing, but for a long time he just wants to go to sea as a sailor. Um, but um, So whether or not Panuccio is actually referencing that, I don't know for sure, but it's interesting. He says he was called to the sea. Um, he initially portrays himself as actually not liking school because in Italy, um, school he, he interprets school as being all about the stamping of tradition upon him. So he rejects schooling in Italy. And when he's 13, he kind of signs himself up to um, become a sailor and starts going all around um, and then ends up in the United States. Um, and he shows himself as a much more ambivalent kind of immigrant in that um, as soon as he leaves home, he starts to miss it. And as soon as he, he he's very open about this, as soon as he lands in the United States, he really feels um, cast adrift. Um, he doesn't speak any English. He, uh, it does not happen on to um, welcoming um, sponsors early in his stay. He, um, his first, he's, you know, he, he speaks no English and he has no money. He's pretty desperate. Um, he's easy prey for a, a peonage labor recruiter. So that's somebody who will say, hey, I have a job for you. Just come with me. And they transport him up to Maine. And he's basically held captive to work for his room and board. Um, he has, they, they never pay him, right? They just say, well, you still owe us, right? Whatever it costs you to bring, to get here, you still owe us for that. And you're living in our bunk and eating our food, so um, whatever you're making, it, it isn't enough to pay it off yet. So he has to kind of actually physically escape that um, on a raft, kind of harking to Huck Finn. Um, he has to build a raft and get away, only to find himself in another peonage labor camp, 
and then um, he gets out of that situation finally, but then finds himself now um, in a similar situation with an individual farmer. Again, he keeps happening on all these Americans who are willing to use his labor, but never fully pay him. Um, and he has to keep going and going, and that really conditions, this is, this is um, uh, the person I mentioned earlier who really theorizes this difference between what's a real American and a fake American, and he meets a lot of fake Americans um, before he meets what he would consider a real one, which is someone who is um, open-minded and um, fair. Right? He talks about just this fairness of being paid for your labor so that you can eventually save some and eventually educate yourself. Um, and it's only after he goes through this series of trials, um, meeting people who are not treating him fairly, uh, that he finally meets what he would consider real Americans that help him um, work, save money, learn English, and eventually um, complete high school and then college. Uh, and it's interesting that he finds, he makes, he explicitly says in the United States, I liked learning in the United States because it was the opportunity to make myself new rather than he perceived education in Italy, granted he was also much younger, he perceived education in Italy as just stamping him um, in the path towards priesthood and not really contributing anything. So um, he, he, he has a whole different take. It's something about, again, education and literacy are American traits that he couldn't realize until he was starting to become American. Um, his individuality is a lot more ambivalent in that um, he just he has no family nearby. Um, he rarely encounters other Italians because he, he gets into that peonage labor situation where he's outside of New York City, right? They sent him off to the countryside in Maine, and he's, he doesn't really have an immigrant community around him. Um, so his indiv individuality is much more ambivalent, right? Um, but he is an individual that does make him American. He forges his path. Um, his work and struggle, again, is largely educational after this initial period of um, being in forced labor situations. Um, and uh, he, he really, you know, shows himself uh, quite devoted to that. At one point, he wins this um, oratory competition at the University of Maine, and it's like, again, this moment of, like, affirmation, right? This is who I'm meant to be. Um, this is, if an immigrant can win this competition, um, then surely America is a fair place, and also, surely immigrants can become American. Um, he, he, in terms of um, material and social accomplishment, um, he eventually, he finishes college, he becomes a minister, he eventually becomes a professor of sociology um, at one of the University of California schools. So he does pretty well for himself, although that's not necessarily present in this particular book. His material and social accomplishment in the point of the book is really just having that connection to what he would call real Americans. And he emphasizes over and over again um, in a way that whereas Anton, it, when Anton's writing, it seems like she's just destined to become American. And everything in her path, every hardship in her path, she just turns into um, something she can use to reach this goal of becoming American. Um, Panuzio is much more frank about the contingencies that were in play um, for him to become an American, and that he didn't even decide to become an American until he'd been in the United States for 10 years, because he wasn't quite sure it was a place he wanted to live, um, because some pretty rough stuff happened to him when he first got there. Um, and he, so he, he talks quite a bit about um, how he wants people to keep in mind that when you see uh, um, a foreigner with a criminal record, you can't necessarily assume that um, they didn't commit those crimes out of um, dire, dire necessity. For example, he gets thrown into jail once for hopping a train. Um, so it looks like he has a criminal record, but he was hopping a train trying to get away from one of these places um, that were uh, holding him basically hostage for his labor. Um, and that if there hadn't been individuals who had stepped in to welcome him and help him, that he can't vouch for how he would have ended up. So rather than it being this like, okay, I'm definitely becoming American, there's, there's no two ways about it, um, he's saying, actually, there's, I have some inner qualities that make me American, but I also had a lot of help. Um, and so it's really necessary to create social structures that um, connect what he would call real Americans with people who have come to the United States. Um, and it's interesting, so um, his, the last chapter, this claiming of citizenship signpost, his last chapter is called My Final Choice. Um, so he finally actually gets a chance to return to Italy, and he's returning to Italy to um, 
uh, talk about work that um, the YMCA had done during the war. Um, this is after World War I. And he's returned, he's re he has a chance to return to Italy, and he's just confronted by his old self. And he realizes that he's changed quite a bit, um, and that he's thought about it, and actually he will go back to the United States. Um, <laughs> he wasn't sure how he was going to feel about it when he got there, um, but he got there and he realized he did, he did want to go back to the United States. And it's only kind of at that moment that he says he spiritually um, embraced being an American. Um, and so it's, it's, it's accepting and celebratory in a sense, but it's also um, a lot more um, ambivalent about the uh, vicissitudes that um, came in root, and that maybe maybe the United States wasn't necessarily his ultimate destination, but it's now the one that he's chosen, and that his choice is, is as valuable as anybody's um, accident of birth of being there. Um, and he, he gets into very lofty language, just like Anton. Um, I have now been in America for 19 years. I have grown up here as much as any man can. I've had my education here. I have become a citizen. I have given all I had of youthful zeal and energy in serving my adopted company. I have come to love America as I do my very life, perhaps more, and yet they still call me a foreigner. Um, so I think that's probably a good place to close, leave some time for questions, but also I wanted to, to mention um, that Panunzio's story is a great um, example of the, the constant importance of um, contact between those who are U.S. citizens and you know, we've been born and raised here, and those who have come to this country, and what a huge difference it makes when um, folks take the time to see people um, as people and uh, create a sense of welcome and offering basic assistance like connecting with English language lessons or um, just helping them find their way around town. And there's a, a group of Grinnellians um, and others working together right now um, coordinated by David Ish, um, calling themselves the Community Support for Immigrants, and I think it's so consonant with um, what we see in these stories. Um, this is a group that's just trying to provide basic humanitarian support to immigrants in our community during a period of very tough um, uh, legislative times um, for people opportunity-wise and resources-wise. Um, so uh, I would just strongly encourage you, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, you have a, a chance to put it into action by finding out more about the community of support for immigrants, and there's more information about that on the table on your way out the door. So we have we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has something they would like to ask, Dr. Ben. Excuse me, our daughter went to Germany <coughs> to work and live, married to German, has two children born there. They're both U.S. citizens because she's a U.S. citizen. But when did that happen? I only saw your reference to born in the U.S. And I'm curious, when was that added to the yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure when that was added. So you know, the amendments are pretty concise, um, and they've now been elaborated in law over the course of a lot of years. Um, I do know that's one of the on the Homeland Security page. That's like one of the like first bullet points, right? It's like born or naturalized, or born to U.S. parents. Yeah. I think it's in the Constitution too. As well. Classifying. Eligibility for office. It's, there is, that, that's, I think that is in the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. One more question? Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> So these flyers that Liz referred to are on the table out in the hallway. 